A huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this episode possible. Good morning fellow mathematicians, welcome back to another video wearing glasses today and Christmas merch. If you're interested in Christmas merch you can find the link to the store down there in the description. Today I would like to talk about something that I encountered while doing a video over on Flamble Maths 2. If you haven't checked out Flamble Maths 2 already, feel free to do so. We are posting a lot of calculus content over there, it's getting a tiny bit advanced at the moment. It's quite interesting. You can also find the link to the video I'm talking about right now in the description. So I was talking about orthogonal functions, perpendicular ones, linear functions, meaning they stand in a 90 degrees angle on top of each other. And now I was doing a little Desmos graph and I noticed something peculiar. If you slide the slider for m around a bit, then you are going to notice that our perpendicular lines, so like our edge is going to go kind of in circles or some kind of elliptic way. And when I discovered this, I didn't really know what it is exactly. It looked like an ellipse in some way, but since our um, edge is going to go through the y-intercepts respectively, I thought it's some kind of degenerate ellipse, meaning a circle. But I really couldn't put my finger on it at first. Hence, I did do some research and calculations and I got to the answer after that. And once I got to the answer, it struck me like freaking lightning, what the answer obviously needs to be. So it's going to be quite exciting if you haven't thought about it already then this could be something for you and we are going to dive into the video after talking about today's sponsor the rich so to keep things short and spicy the rich is a wallet made out of for example forged carbon or titanium and this thing right here is extremely durable it's going to be the last wallet you're ever going to need that's a promise from the rich side because you are going to get a lifetime warranty on this tiny little thing right here what I find to be very good about this rich wallet is at first a very industrial and sleek look. So it looks very nice. This is the forged carbon one. You can find other colors over on their website like the burnt titanium one. And also it can hold up to 12, for example, credit cards like this one right here. That's my Blutspenderausweis if I want to donate blood, for example. So it's kind of interesting how much stuff it can actually hold. And for my purposes, it's more than enough to hold 12 cards. And I don't need my old wallet anymore now that I have the rich wallet because apart from putting credit cards for example into here you can also put your spare money onto the back side it does not only come with the money strap you can also buy it with a money clip for example this is what I did too but after trying around a tiny little bit I really enjoyed the money strap a tiny little bit more than a money clip overall but if you don't trust your dad and you still think, well, I'm not sure if this right here is a great wallet, then make sure to check out the over 30k five-star reviews that they have received all over the place. Amazon, Google reviews or their website in general. They are going to tell you exactly what I'm telling you here. It's a very durable and very nice wallet. It looks sleek, it looks good. It's going to change your whole pocket situation just like it did for me. So if you want to try it out and support the channel, you can use the link rich.com slash Papa Flemmy down there at the top of the description to get 10% of your whole order. So the whole rich wallet collection in some way and also if you want a money clip for example instead of a money strap, you're going to get 10% of your whole order as well as worldwide free shipping which is a great deal if you ask me. Now you can support the channel this way and now we are going to dive right in. and it really doesn't hurt a thing if I throw it away because Forge Carbon is just extremely durable and it's absolutely amazing. Now we are going to dive into the main video and at first I would like to recall what it means for two function to be um, this right here, perpendicular, okay, 90 degrees angle. Um, if we have a general linear function of the form, let's say um, f of x being equal to ax plus b, okay, where b is our y-intercept and a is our slope, then we can pretty easily construct ourselves the um, function perpendicular to it. And there's this one perpendicularity condition, what a stupid fucking word, perpendicularity condition, which just tells us that we are going to take the reciprocal of our slope a right here and we are going to put a negative sign in front of it. So we are going to change the sign around. So if we had a being equal to 3 as our original slope, then a function perpendicular to this function f of x is going to be of the form negative 1 third times x plus some 
y intercept really doesn't matter what it is, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so we are going to say g of x is equal to negative 1 over a times x plus um, let's say some other y intercept b2. Okay, now we have two functions which are orthogonal to one another. Okay, they lie in the coordinate system like this, and de depending on how we change our slope a, it's going to make this weird elliptical or circular rotation in the coordinate system. And we want to find out what geometric figure it's actually tracing out overall. And for this I would like to give f of x and g of x a new name. Let's say those are both equal to r. Why am I setting both equal to r? I'm doing this because if we look at the line that is going to be traced out, okay, um, let's say um, the line being traced out um, has this kind of el elliptic shape for example, then our functions are going to look like this all the time and the geometric figure being traced out by those two orthogonal functions is going to be traced out by the intersection point. So if we go down here it's going to look like this for example, okay. This geometric figure that we are looking for is going to be traced out by the intersection point, meaning at each and every point on the circle ellipse whatsoever, it's just going to be the same y and x coordinate for both of these functions. It does make sense if you think about it for a second. Okay, now we got those two functions right here, and if you want to find out if it's an ellipse or a circle, for example, you are going to take a look at the parametric curve that they both trace out. Meaning we are going to find an e equation which is with respect to x and y, it's parametric curve. Meaning we are trying to preserve our y for example and our x. Meaning overall we don't want to subtract those or solve a system of equations. What we want to rather do is for example multiply those two equations together such that we are going to preserve our x and y. This was my initial thought behind it. Really doesn't matter if you just multiply those together. What I did initially was to solve for x on both equations and then multiply those two equations with respect to x and y together. So let's do this real quick. This was just what I did and it turned out quite nicely. So let us solve the first equation for x. We are going to subtract b1 on both sides. Okay, meaning we are going to have b1, uh, no, where? minus b1. And also on the left hand side we are going to have a times x under the condition that a is not equal to zero. We are going to divide both sides by it, meaning x is hence nothing but y minus b1 over a. Okay, thus far that's good. Now we are going to do the same spiel here. What we are going to do is we are going to um, multiply both sides by negative one at first. This is something that you can do. Okay, to get rid of the negative sign for example. And now we can add b2 on both sides. Um, by the way, negative 1 is not equal to 0, hence we can divide both sides by it or multiply by it. Meaning we are going to add b2 on both sides, meaning we are going to get b2 minus y, okay, with change signs basically right now. Also, now we are going to have 1 over a times x, we are going to multiply both sides by a under the condition that's not equal to 0. This is something that we didn't want, otherwise we would have a singularity. This is exactly the point as, um, at our y-axis that we are going to have. Uh, meaning overall, we are going to get that x is hence nothing but b squared minus y times a. Now we have those two equations which we can multiply together now and see what we are going to get. Meaning, if we were to multiply the left hand sides together, we are going to get x squared is hence nothing but, okay, multiplying those together a and a is going to cancel out, which is good, meaning our parametric equation is not with respect to our slope at all, which, which is kind of curious if you ask me, meaning overall we are going to get b2 minus y times y minus b1. Now we can start factoring stuff out and bringing stuff together and you're going to see in a second that it's going to be a certain geometric figurine um, from the get-go. It's pretty clear what it's going to be overall. If we were to factor out everything, on the right hand side we are going to get um, b2 times y um, plus b1 times y, okay, this and this, um, this and this, multiplied together. Also we are going to get um, negative b2 b1 and also we are going to get negative y squared. And now here comes in the cool part. So on the one hand we are going to add y squared on both sides in some way, meaning we are going to get x squared plus y squared being equal to b, uh, b2 plus b1 times y. Okay, we are going to factor out y here, minus b2 b1. And you might notice something if you just ignore this side. You are going to get an equation of the form x squared plus y squared being equal to something. This right here screams for being a circle. 
and overall it's going to result later in our geometric figurine being a circle, which is quite cool, which does make sense if you think about it, because a degenerate ellipse where our foci are exactly on our ellipse is a circle. It does make perfect sense if, if you think about it. And if you interpret it using a theorem out of geometry later in the game, you are going to notice that, well, you could have seen this all along that it's going to trace out a circle overall. But we are going to do a few more manipulations here because we can get a very nice expression for our circle overall. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sub subtract this part on both sides and also I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going to subtract this part on both sides, meaning we're going to get x squared minus b2 plus b1 times y plus y squared, this hence nothing but negative b2 b1. And you might notice that we can actually use the binomial theorem here on this part a tiny little bit. This is what we are going to do now. So in order for us to use the binomial theorem on this part, we still need to find out what we need to add and subtract. We are going to complete the square here. Um, maybe you are a bit f more familiar with this part if we rewrite it a tiny little bit as being y squared minus b2 plus b1 times y. So recall what we need to have for the binomial theorem. If we have um, a plus b squared, it's going to result in a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. This is what we are going to have. Identify what our a is. Our a in our case is hence nothing but y. Also, when other stuff is missing, we have our a here. Hmm. Our b is probably our b2 plus b1, but what's still missing is our 2 in front. We are going to get the 2 by just multiplying and dividing by 2 overall. Meaning overall, this right here is our a, our y is our a, and our b in our case is nothing but b2 plus b1 over 2. Meaning what we need to do here in order for us to complete the square is add on the one hand b2 plus b1 over 2, but the whole thing squared because we need b squared, but we also need to subtract it because, well, you can just add something, it would change the whole equation. Meaning, we can either subtract it on this side all along, or we can just add this factor or this sum end on both sides. Meaning, to make things a bit easier for us, we are also going to add this factor on both sides, b2 plus b1 over 2, but the whole thing squared. Imagine you have added it here too, now we can use the binomial theorem on this one, leaving us with y plus, and now, um, no, it's going to be a negative sign because we have a negative sign in front, and exactly our b is nothing but b2 plus b1 over 2, but the whole thing squared. This is what's going to happen when you use the binomial theorem. Now we are going to write everything out yet again, meaning x squared plus y minus b1 plus b2 over 2 squared is hence nothing but b1, um, yeah, b1 plus b2 over 2 squared minus b1, b2. Okay, here's the first thing. Now we have a circle equation. This right here is our radius in some way, okay, radius squared, we, we can still factor this nicely in a second, but more importantly what we have here is this is the equation of a circle, but the circle is centered at b1 plus b2 over 2. Meaning it's centered right in the middle of the distance between b1 and b2. Basically not the distance, but um, if you add b1 to b2 and take it over 2, this is going to be the center of your circle. Okay, um, just as a little side note. This is what we are going to have right now as being the center. And now we are going to find out the radius. What is it exactly? For this, we are going to write everything out. This part right here is going to be, okay, if you use the binomial theorem, we are going to get b1 squared over 4 plus b2 squared over 4 and then in the middle part we are going to get 2 times b1, b2 over 2 each and every time, meaning we are going to get um, plus b1, b2 over 2. I hope you can see where this came from because what we are going to have is 2 times b1 over 2 times b2 over 2 is 2 times something over 4. It's going to result in b1, b2 over 2 and also we are going to subtract b1, b2 from it. And you might notice if we subtract this from this, okay, or the other way around, really doesn't matter, we are going to get overall that this is nothing but 
negative b1 b2 over 2. So we are going to turn this negative sign uh, this positive sign into negative sign and you might notice that this thing right here is basically just a binomial theorem we have used a second ago but with a negative sign this time. Meaning on the right hand side what we are going to get is nothing but, okay now we need to take care of it by saying this is b1 minus b2 over 2 but the whole thing squared. So let us recap. This right here is our radius squared. It's, it's the equation of a circle of the form x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So we have a radius of the circle being the absolute value you could say of b1 minus b2 over 2. So if you take the distance of those two y-intercepts that we are going to have and you are going to take it over 2 you are going to get the radius. Taking the absolute value of course because the radius is defined as being positive. Also this thing is centered at b1 plus b2 over 2 and this is basically the circus equation. And now here comes the last insight that was the thing that struck me like lightning when I first um, evaluated it is if we take a look at it now we are going to have a circle as be oh that's a nice looking circle as being our parametric um, figure that we are going to have geometric figure and all the time we are going to have something like this so here's our y-intercept all the time because our circle goes exactly through the y-intercepts this is something that's going to happen meaning our functions looks like this and since it's perpendicular to it, I'm going to try to get it nicely. Yeah, that looks actually pretty good. Okay, this is what it's going to look like in a coordinate system. Since we have a circle, you can also um, visualize this using Desmos. I'm going to do this in a second. Other than that, if we were to draw on the y-axis too, this is the point where I thought, oh, holy shit, I could have seen this before. We are going to have a right triangle in here inside the circle and this is what you call at least in Germany Thales Satz, Satz von Thales or in uh, English probably Thales theorem. Thing is if you take the sides of a circle which go um, di directly through the diameter right here so just like we did here then if you go to any point on the circle right here really doesn't matter what you do if you do it like this or if you do it like this, you are always going to get a right triangle out. And by using Thales theorem you can also show that there is no right triangle for example where the hypotenuse is um, smaller than the height for example inside of this thing because the hypotenuse is always um, greater. It, uh, the, the height in here could uh, possibly be only um, the, the radius. This is the maximum height you could have in the right triangle for example. Yeah and, and this was the consequence here and I think this is a way to prove Thales theorem using analytic geometry. I have never thought about it before but I thought this was quite, quite interesting. So yeah um, this was just a little um, inside video. Here's another little Desmos interpretation of this thing. And that basically concludes the video. There was just a bit of talking and playing around. I just thought this was an interesting fact. Okay, nothing too serious, but maybe some people are interested in elementary geometry or analytic geometry and stuff like this. So like I said before, you can uh, check out Fremble Maths too to take a look at a bit more maths content. Uh, last time doing a few nice and chill videos, just talking a tiny little bit without uh, anything really planned. Um, other than that, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, like, comment, channel, like. Don't forget to also check out STEM merch this week on STEM week we are having um, the STEM plan merch going on so that's quite a thing and until the next video I wish you guys a uh, flambele. Ciao! <laughs>